financial needs so that they continue, may continue to serve. But Father, we ask that even as they are out serving and giving of themselves, God, that you'd meet their spiritual needs, continue to strengthen them. Father, uh, meet their health needs, keep them safe. Father, we just ask that you would uh, uh, protect them in each and every aspect of their lives. Be with the services here. Uh, be with the Sunday school classes that will be taking place. Be with the service to come. God, would you be glorified in all that is done, we ask in your name. Amen. All right. Um, continuing our, uh, our study, uh, character study, basically, looking at some of the, uh, the people that God called twice, or a double salutation, as he, as he called them. Um, looking at Moses this week. Uh, I've got there on the title slide, a reluctant leader. God called them and says, I want you to go. And Moses said, let me think about that. No. Um, and God, every time, you know, if Moses put up an obstacle, God worked out or overcame the obstacle. Um, before we get to Exodus 3, uh, I forgot to give you the reference last week. This is the one I gave you because uh, we looked at the idea that he was a wrestler. Um, quickly, before we get to Exodus, go to uh, Genesis 46. I had it in my notes, not the notes I have up here, my, uh, my working notes, and then forgot to put it on my, on my uh, handout and, uh, and the slides. So go to Genesis 46 quickly. We'll just look at a couple of verses here, uh, beginning in verse 1. Genesis 46, beginning in verse 1. And Israel, Jacob, uh, took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father, Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night, and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, Here am I. And he said, I am the God, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for there I will make of thee a great nation. And he continues on talking about what he's going to do. Now I find a couple of things interesting. I don't have a lot of extra time to take with Jacob, but a couple of things interesting. And Israel took his journey, and God called him and didn't call him by Israel. We mentioned that last week. Here's a man whose name was changed, and he's most often referred to by the original previous name, Jacob. Um, and I find it interesting, don't be afraid to go down into Egypt, I'm gonna make you a great nation. That happened, but think about the long and winding path that took for that to happen. They became slaves. Well, that's not too great a nation. Um, and as they left, they were more of a incredibly large tribe than a nation. Um, they, they didn't have a country yet, although they knew where they were going. And all so often, when put in a difficult place, they said, what, I think we'll go back to Egypt. And so it was a, a long and winding path for them to be that great nation. But this is a continuation of the Abrahamic covenant that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. As God made the promise to Abraham and included within that was, I'll give you a land, I'm gonna make you a great people. And continuation there. Turn over a couple of pages then. Exodus 3. Exodus 3 as we look at Moses. Um, interesting, interesting individual for sure. Um, if you look at the handouts, uh, the conclusion on the back page is just that. There's no notes underneath because ran out of space, did not want to add another, and do not like to make it bifocal necessary to read. So it, uh, it is what it is. Verses 1 through 10, we have the burning bush here. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Ah... Momentary pause here. Did he have any idea what would happen at this mount later? Because he will be back. And there will be a, uh, some really interesting things happen here. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he, God, said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Okay, keep in mind that last line. 
we may mention it, depend on time, when we get back to this same mount, and he goes into the mount and it says that he looked upon the very face of God. Here, he hides his face. Common response. So, Moses, with a quick character study, um, our introduction. First of all, uh, he is one of the most notable figures in the Old Testament. Uh, no question about that. Um, significant in a variety of ways. Uh, the leader of the nation, um, a go-between between the nation and God. Um, there's just so much that he is a writer of the first few books. Uh, very, very significant. He was from the family of the house of Levi, um, specifically um, the Kohathites. Uh, I, would, I would think that you're familiar as you read through the uh, Leviticus and all as the tribes are given their land and the Levites don't get a land. They have the responsibility to serve God and the different uh, sons of Levi, their families are then given certain tasks within that broad field of serving God. The name Moses um, in Hebrew is drawn out of the water, which makes sense. We know the story. He was, uh, as a babe, put in the basket in the water. Um, there's an Egyptian meaning to it as well. Um, if you've studied in, in, your, uh, in, in your studies of ancient history, uh, if you've studied the, uh, the Egyptian gods, many of their gods, their last, their, their two-part name, the second part is Mos or Mosa, or th like Thutmosa, uh, so it was a pharaoh's name and things like that. And so there's an Egyptian side to this, which it fits in as well. Um, pharaoh's daughter bears forth a son. Basically, she gets a son by pulling him out of the water. And so there's two, part, two different ways to look at it, but they both fit real well with this man. Now, we looked at Jacob from Jacob going to Egypt until Moses. There's a 400-year gap. There's silence. Um, you ever, and there was silence from heaven the space of 400 years. We see something similar at the end of the Old Testament before we get into the New Testament period. Um, but there's a 400-year gap here. And then Moses comes on the scene. Some background. Oh, cool. Get the whole slide at once. Um, he was the youngest of three kids. I, we're not 100% sure. Uh, we know of two specifically because they're named. Uh, but there are numerous instances in the Old Testament where those that are significant to the story are named and others are not. But we know that there was, uh, uh, there was Miriam, there was Aaron, and there was Moses. And you can get a rough idea as to the ages of Miriam and Aaron at his birth. He's introduced to us in Exodus 2. Um, talks about that he was born. Pharaoh had issued a decree. Uh, we'll mention it just briefly here in a, in a moment. Pharaoh had issued a decree, no male children. And if there's a male child born, male child is to die. And... Uh, so there's the story where he is kept in the home basically until he probably gets too loud. They put him in a basket, put him in the, put him in the Nile. And uh, we have that story coming to us in Exodus chapter 2. It's interesting as we look at Moses and read and study about him, he serves as a mediator uh, between the people and God. The people don't go to God. Even if they come back to Sinai, um, the people are like, we're terrified. You go talk to him. Uh, he serves as the go-between. Uh, he's a type of Christ and that he's a deliverer. So he's a mediator like Christ. He's a deliverer. He takes them from Egypt to the land of promise. Uh, he represents the law. A couple things that are interesting with that is he represents the law. Um, he was not a perfect man. We see that. But there was one one, count him one, violation that kept him from going into the land of promise. How much sin or how many sin does it take to keep us from getting in to heaven? And so there, there's some interesting uh, correlations here as we, as we look at uh, Moses. Uh, hey, this one here does, does go line by line. Uh, his life is very easily divided into three segments. And you've probably, if you've, if you've had any kind of a Bible study in regards to Moses, you've probably heard this because... It works well for anybody and everybody. Uh, but it, it's divided up into uh, three segments. We have his life in Egypt, 
his life in Midian and then his life in the, heading to the land of promise. And then he is mentioned in the, uh, in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11. Um, we may or may not have time, but we're going to go there anyhow. Keep your place here in Exodus. We may get back to this. Let's go to Hebrews 11 very, very quickly. Um, Hebrews 11 and uh, verse 23. Uh, I want to read this now because we will see these passages referenced again in the notes a little bit later. Beginning in verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. There's a, that's an interesting statement right there all by itself. Uh, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of, of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they... Now, talking about the children of Israel, but who was leading them still at this time. They passed through the Red Sea to dry land, which the Egyptians is saying to do were drowned. And then it stops there because by faith, the walls of Jericho, he was not present then. But we've got a, a, a good handful of verses here talking about Moses and things that he did that were, if you want to say, noteworthy. Let's go back to uh, Moses specifically, born uh, around 1525 B.C. Um, I don't have a timeline. I mean, I, I have timelines. I just don't have them with us. If you want to find one, they are available. But you can kind of get an idea. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, 400-year gap, Moses. Uh, you can get a rough idea of what's happening here. An interesting study it would be an extra biblical study, is to see what happened in Egypt. How did they go from Joseph being the vice pharaoh to being slaves? What's transpiring? How did this take place? Um, in 1445 B.C., he would have been about 80 years old. Again, we take his life, we can easily divide it into three equal parts. And he lived for about 120 years. Uh, I say about. He lived for 120 years. Uh, so major events, we're just going to divide it into the 40-year 40 40 year segments. Uh, his birth through age 40. First of all, we see he's placed in the river. He's born. They keep him, as we saw in Hebrews here, they keep him for three months. Um, then they put him in the basket in the river. Um, Pharaoh had declared, no male children allowed. You can see the sign on the, on the clubhouse door, right? Uh, no boys. And so he's hidden. And I put down here, until he became noisy. Why keep him for three months and not four? I mean, just think through, there's got to be a good reason here. Um, and so to the river he goes. Um, they put him in the basket, put him in the river. And in the river, he's discovered by the daughter of Pharaoh. All the people that could have been there, isn't that ironic that it's this one? Who was probably the one person in the land that could have ignored what Pharaoh had to say? probably his teenage daughter. <laughs> um, so she finds Moses. Miriam is watching. Hey, if you need somebody to help you raise this child, I know somebody. And Moses is raised. Now, he grows up in the palace. And, and that is important for us to understand. Uh, we saw back in, in Hebrews... Uh, he's learning at all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He gained the very best training available in the world at that time. That's kind of interesting, because the rest of the family was slaves. And it tells he was mighty in word and deed. I mean, he was, he was somebody that was out there. I don't know that Pharaoh was going to allow this stranger to take over as the next pharaoh, but he had a place within the family. And through all of this, uh, he's learning to be somebody. Uh, D.L. Moody it was that said he spent 40 years being somebody. If you're the 
son of Pharaoh's daughter. Think, how do you walk around the streets of Egypt? Right? Well, then we go to life from 40 to 80. The turning point is he saves the life of the Israelite slave, the Hebrew slave. And Pharaoh wants him dead, and we'll see that in just a moment. And so he has to flee. Now, the slaves were nothing but mere tools. They were expendable. If a slave died, you took another one and plugged him in that place. The Egyptians did not really care. And we know that because what did, why, why did Moses have to flee? Because the taskmaster was going to beat the Hebrew slave to death. And Moses saved him. Well, we wonder then, because of what's happened here, growing up in the palace, was Moses conflicted? He knows his family, slaves. He knows where he is at the table of opulence. You wonder if he's conflicted in his heart and mind about where he is and where his people are. Seems that way. And as a result of what he's done here, uh, Pharaoh wants to kill him. And so he flees to Midian. Um, I have the map, uh, two different maps. One of them is the same one we had last week. Uh, but I have a map coming up here in a little bit. Um, if you want to look at a map in your Bible and see uh, where Midian is in regards to where Egypt was, uh, it may have taken him a day or two to get there. But get there he did. And he takes up lodging with Jethro, uh, described in the Bible as the priest of Midian. Um, he marries Jethro's daughter, and he becomes a shepherd. Now, that is interesting. Uh, think back. Exodus, Jacob goes to Egypt. If you recall the story, the Egyptians did not think much of shepherds at all. Didn't like him. Keep that in mind. He had grown up in the palace. I'm wondering if he had soft work at a desk hands. And now he's out working with the sheep. Manual labor kind of stuff. His life has radically changed. At the moment that he intervened on the behalf of that Hebrew slave, nothing would be the same for this man. And so he becomes a shepherd. We saw in Exodus 3, he encountered the burning bush. Uh, ver, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, he kept the flock of Jethro's father-in-law. So much has happened. He's on the backside of the desert. You'll hear that description often when talking about Moses. He comes to Horeb, the Mount of God. Did he know that was Horeb and did he know that was the Mount of God? God appears to him in the burning bush. He doesn't see the God, he sees the burning and the fact that the bush isn't, even though it is burning. It's on fire, but nothing's happening. And he says, hmm, this is interesting, let me go take a look at that. What would you have done? Um, if you're driving by, you would have held up traffic because everybody has to turn and watch as they go by, right? And that's where he is, he's, he's, he's got sheep. What are the sheep gonna do, where are they gonna go? I'm going to go check out this bush. And he goes to the bush, and God says, I've been waiting for you. Take off your shoes. You're, this is holy ground. So he sees this burning bush. God speaks to him. It's not just that God is present there. God is everywhere. It's that God, very specifically, was right there to meet with Moses. God called him, and Moses said, eh, no. Can't do it. Not qualified. Now think for a moment. Grew up in the palace, all the learning that Egypt had to offer. If there was anybody qualified, who was it? He singled in on the one thing, and he may have had, from what we see here, he may very well have had a speech impediment. We don't know. That's the excuse he gives, so we'll say perhaps he did. Did that hinder God's call? Did that limit God's ability to use him? 
God simply said, I'll tell you what, Aaron's on his way, he'll help you. Now it's interesting, one of many things interesting. From this point here, um, I'm going to send Aaron to help you. How often do we see Aaron speaking? Almost every instance when they're talking, who's doing the speaking? Moses. Now God introduces himself very clearly. Well, if I go and tell the people that you've sent me, who, do, who, who are you? And he says very clearly, uh, here in verse 14, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Thus shall you say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. They knew very clearly who that was. There was no mistaking this. Kind of like in the New Testament when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, and the people said, whoa, time out. What did you just say? There was no misunderstanding. They knew. And so God very clearly introduces himself, gives him a call, and gives him the tools that he needs to accomplish that call. So while he's in the desert, he's learning to be a nobody. He's a shepherd. Who cares about the shepherds? Well, God did. Not the first time, not the last time that God uses a shepherd. So then we go to the next, the next segment of his life, 80 to 120. We're going to look at Moses and Aaron as they return to Egypt. Uh, they go to Pharaoh and they say, hey, God said, let my people go. And Pharaoh's response was, eh, no, don't think so. Then we come to the plagues. And we've got these plagues. These plagues are all directed toward the individual deities of Egypt. This is God showing that he was God and that he was more powerful than the gods that they were serving. You have your God? Let me squash him. This was not simply overpowering Egypt. This was taking their entire religious system and pounding it into dust. Showing that I am that I am is present. And these plagues show the very power of God. And so the Israelites get permission to leave. Remember, that's after the death of the firstborn. The, if you, if you say the highlight of the plagues, I mean, you talk about the death of probably millions of people. But God says, you want to keep playing games with this, watch this. I am, because they, they revered that firstborn to the point. Back in this age, the Pharaoh was a deity. He was a god. And the next Pharaoh was going to be the firstborn, so obviously he must then be a god. And God Almighty shows them there are no other gods. It is I and I alone. And so they are humbled. They get permission to go. And about the time they get next door, Pharaoh changes his mind and collects his army. Now the army, if the firstborn of every family was killed, the army had to have been decimated. I mean, think about that for a second. But it didn't matter. You're following after slaves. What are they going to do? And uh, so they follow after. And they get to the Red Sea. And, the, oh boy, now we've got a problem. How are we going to cross the sea? Or how are we going to go around the sea? Or we're not going under it, not going over it. How is this going to happen? And God makes a way. He parts the Red Sea. The Egyptians, they've got a plan. And they follow after. And God says, oh, no, you don't. And uses the walls of water to collapse upon them and drown the armies. And annihilates the army of Egypt at that point. A couple things that are interesting. We, when we think of the children of Israel as Moses leads them out, we have the Exodus. That's, they leave Egypt and go to the Promised Land. But remember, they get to the Promised Land and then decide not to enter. Then we have the wilderness wandering. There, it's really two parts. We often use it somewhat synonymously, and it's not necessarily wrong to do that, but there's actually two parts to this. 
they exit Egypt and then tell God we're not interested in entering, then God says, okay, now you're going to walk around aimlessly for 40 years. And so we've got these, these two different parts of this. During this time, we find Moses, on the behalf of God, doing miracles. And Moses is the first in the scripture that we see actually doing miracles. Where we see he, the, the waters are bitter and they threw the tree in and the waters are then good to drink. Or they need something to drink and God tells him smite the rock. We see that rock again later, don't we? Uh, but we see God using Moses to perform miracles to meet the needs of the people and to show them that he is still there and will provide for them. So they have this time in the wilderness. As they go through the wilderness, it's not as if Moses has his GPS or has a Rand McNally map. How do they know where to go? They have the direct leading of God, the pillar of fire, pillar of cloud. And when the cloud stays, they stay. When the cloud moves, they move. Moses is the intermediary between God and the people. But God is personally involved in their travels. We see the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, at Mount Sinai. They're back to the Mount of God. And they, they, let's say, hang out there. They encamp there for a while. The people do not want to go up or get too close. They're terrified by the thunderings and all that they, lightnings and thunderings that they see in here. And so Moses goes to the top and he communes with God face to face. He comes down, his face is shining. They tell him to put on a veil. We can't look at you. Your, your face is bright. But when he comes down with the tablet, they're worshiping a false god. And we see him chunking the tablet and breaking it and all that takes place there. And so we find during this wandering, one of the themes is conflict and another is murmuring. These people must have been a bear to work with, right? They were never happy. They were never satisfied. Nothing went the way it was supposed to because there's only two ways things could go, their way and the wrong way. And they were convinced if it wasn't their way, it was wrong. And God was often saying, you need to understand I am in charge. All that God did for them. They move on down the road 10 miles and they're fussing and complaining again. Their wandering was a result of the lack of faith. Not Moses' lack of faith. And if we wanted to add in the others, we had Caleb, right? And Joshua. We had others, but the majority of the people, pretty much all the people, had a lack of faith and everybody paid a price for it. Now, one of the interesting notes here is that Moses, when Moses entered the wilderness, Moses never left the wilderness. He didn't go into the promised land. He was able to see the promised land from the top of the mount, but he never went in. And yet he did. We'll see that in a little bit. And so, we had that Moses learned to be somebody in Egypt. He learned to be nobody in Midian. And now he learns that God can use a nobody and make him somebody. God can use anybody he chooses. That includes you and I. Here's our map. I don't expect you to be able to see and to follow the dotted lines, but we've got Egypt over here, promised land over here, and they travel across the Red Sea and down around through the Sinai Peninsula and up. A um, number of reasons why we can't just take the shortcut and go this way. Don't have time to go into all those. But then they get over here to the Jordan, and this is where they're going to come into the Promised Land. And so not a, not a uh, as the crow flies path whatsoever. Um, God's preparing them for entry. And they decide they don't want to, and God says, okay, fine. Then. Here's the wilderness. Enjoy. And then they come back, and they're ready to enter at that point. Um, that's where they're headed to, you know, the land of promise, where they're going to cross in. Um, but that's where they're coming from. You would think 
again, if we were going to take, take the path, the road here, we'd go right this way. But between powerful nations that don't want people to go through and the terrain and all, that's not the path that God takes. And he needs them to have some time so he can mold them to the people that they need to be. Well, back to Moses, major themes. And again, time is, is moving quickly, which is why there's no grand conclusion on this one. Uh, we find Moses, I've got this. We cannot get away from the life of Moses without seeing the couple of instances when he says, I can, I can do this. Um, when the slave needed help, Moses stepped in to help. Fantastic. Or not. I mean, glad he wanted to help, but was his method necessarily OSHA approved? Um, you know, this is, this is the way he's going to do this. And we see that happen when he gets, remember we mentioned that rock. The second time they come to the rock, God says, speak to the rock and I'll give them water. And he got frustrated with the people and took the rod and smote the rock as he did the first time they were there. There are a couple of instances when he acted rashly, when he acted hastily, if you will. It's not as if his life is characterized by that, but when you're studying the life of Moses, you can't get away from those couple. We see uh, Moses, the lawgiver, he interacted with God directly at Mount Sinai. And God gave him the law. Moses then took the law to Israel. And as you study that, you can't get away from the fact that, huh, take two. He broke it into pieces. Had to go back to the mount and God gave the law again. The first time God wrote it, second time Moses had to write it, but he received the law again, a, a, a new, ver new edition of the Ten Commandments. And so we have the lawgiver. And we can't get away from the fact that Moses, the leader, the, he led the masses through the wilderness. Even if there were trade routes that they were following, this is a large group of people. Most estimations are somewhere between two and four million people. This is a large group of people. And as we've already mentioned, this is a large group of people who are never satisfied, who always want something different and are never happy, and do a really good job of making everyone around them miserable. And he led them through the wilderness. Were there problems? Were there hiccups? Yes, but he led them successfully, did he not? He was, a, he was a leader. He overcame his limitations. God, I can't do that. I'll send you help. We don't know specifically how much talking Aaron did, but like I mentioned already, we don't see Aaron doing a lot of talking. He's more, he's more there to provide moral support at this point, it seems like. Moses overcame the limitation. God gave him the ability to do what God told him to do. We see even as a leader that he was meek. Uh, he's, he's, he's characterized as meekest man on the earth. He was meek. He was humble. He was not full of himself. The proverbial self-made man. That was not Moses. Moses was a humble individual. One of the interesting things about Moses is he was willing to accept help. He was willing to listen to advice. Jethro came. Um, I've got the reference there. Time says we can't go to it. But it's interesting. Jethro comes to visit, and Jethro sees all this taking place and says, man, what are you doing? There is a better way to do this. You're going to burn yourself out. And Moses listened. So many people in charge, they have all the answers. There's nothing you're going to say that's going to help. And here's a man that was willing to listen. We think of the battle. The chapter prior to Jethro, we find them doing battle, and Moses is up on the mount holding up the rod. And as his arms grow tired, the children of Israel start to lose. If he keeps it up, the children of Israel win. Well, later in the day, as his arms are growing tired and they're losing, Aaron and Hur step in and hold up his arms. I've got this, leave me alone. Now, Moses accepted help. 
And then as we find the humble man of God. Back in Hebrews 11, we saw where it said, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Here he was in the palace, and yet he remembered where he came from. We mentioned he didn't go into the New Testament. Uh, but kind of. Go to Matthew 17, and we will turn here. Matthew 17. At the end of his physical life on earth, he was allowed to look over and to see the land of promise. We find here the, what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. Look at verse 3. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here if thou wilt. Let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. I got a couple questions when I read this. These guys had died a long time ago. How did he know who they were? Um, I just, lots, as I read it, lots of things. I would have been more likely, hey, Jesus, who are these people? Uh, but we see Moses here in the land of promise now. And we see that he intercedes on behalf of the people. That's something that you cannot miss as you read through these journeys through the wilderness. He intercedes on behalf of the people more than once. There's, an, there's the instance and it comes to mind, God says, step aside, I'm going to wipe them out and start over again. And Moses says, God, you can't do that. What would the people around say, that you failed? We have Moses intercede. They've been causing him nothing but grief for years. Normal man would have said, go right ahead. I've been waiting for this day. Right? And here's Moses interceding on their behalf. Again, we saw earlier type of Christ. He is a mediator between God and man. And we find Moses performing that task. Our key verse, go to the end of the book of Deuteronomy. Very end of the book of Deuteronomy. So many verses that we could pull out and say, well, this is a key verse. These probably sum up the life of Moses as much as any. Deuteronomy 34, 10 through 12. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. In all signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to his servants and to all his land. So there's his working of miracles, sending the plagues. And in all the mighty hand and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. They saw he was the mouthpiece of God, that he was the very hand of God in this place. And again, they were, they were scared. There was not a prophet since. We get to the end of his life, and the final statement is, this was a great man. And then it gives us a couple reasons why. So conclusion, a couple things. We mentioned already uh, the lawgiver. And there was that one act where God said, you cannot do that. You do not get to enter into the promised land. Representative of the fact that we cannot get to heaven with even one sin. We have to have forgiveness. There's so much that we look at that we see here. Um, it was one where I had more to put in, but I ran out of pay space. And I'm like, if I know about where I am with times with my page here, so it's just not going to happen. But you can go through and read through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and find so much more about Moses. Goes to the burning bush. Moses, Moses, take off your shoes. You're in holy ground. And what did he do? He obeyed. We're not a perfect man, but we find a life of obedience throughout. Goes back to Pharaoh. Shows the greatness of God Almighty not only in Egypt, but as he leads the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land, and then wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years before they get back to the promised land, a land he never enters into in this physical life, but does stand in 
at the top of the Mount of Transfiguration, a man that God used greatly. Father, thank you so much.